Hey friends, welcome to the Engage Bible Study with Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Burnsville, Minnesota. My name is Jeff Marion. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I'm so glad you joined me as we continue our journey through some of Paul's letters. Today, we find ourselves in Paul's letter to the Colossians. But before we get into our study, just a couple of really quick announcements. If you're a part of the Prince of Peace community, you probably know by now that we have resumed on-campus worship. We're offering two identical services on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30. It's been so good to see people face to face. But we recognize that not everyone is ready to come back to on-campus worship, and that's just fine. We will continue to offer online worship, which will premiere on Sunday mornings at 9.45. And whenever you are ready to come back to campus, we would love to see you. And while it's hard to believe, Easter is just around the corner on Sunday, April the 4th. And we'll be offering uh, services on Saturday night at 5.30 and on Easter Sunday at 8, 9.30, and 11 o'clock. Now, we're currently allowed to have about 500 people in the sanctuary per our governor's order. And uh, we know that yeah, 9.30 will probably be the most popular of service time. So we're taking reservations for Easter worship. And if you can come to a service other than 9.30, that would be spectacular, making room for all of our guests. You'll find more information on our website, and you will be able to register for Easter worship beginning the week of March the 15th. And of course, we will premiere Easter worship online on Sunday morning at 9.45. All right, enough of the in-house announcements. Let's get to our study. Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians, a young church that would be located now in modern Turkey. But Paul didn't plant this church. In fact, we're not even sure Paul had ever been in Colossae. But he learned about the congregation from a man named Epaphras and learned some of the struggles that they were facing as a faith community. And since Paul loved all in the church, he wrote this letter to these Christians to encourage them and to strengthen them. Now, by reading Paul's letter carefully, we can do a little reverse detective work and determine what some of the struggles are that they were facing. It seems that the Gentiles, that is the non-Jewish Christians in this community, were wrestling with whether Jesus was different or merely one in the pantheon of Greek gods, one of many gods. Which is why Paul writes so eloquently about Jesus in this letter, talking about him as the one who existed before creation, the one who now sits at the right hand of God above all others. It also appears that the Jewish members of this Colossian church were struggling with the same question that the Galatian Christians were, that is, the place of the law. Do Jewish Christians or all Christians need to follow the Jewish law in order to be right with God? And Paul emphatically says no. The law is good and it guides us in daily life, but it is not a means of being in relationship with God. That's a matter of grace and faith alone. And there seems to be one more issue that Paul addresses in this little letter that is particularly relevant to the section that we're going to be looking at today. Paul, as you may remember, is in prison as he writes this letter. And Paul's critics have apparently been telling Christians in Colossae and elsewhere that Paul doesn't really have the authority to speak for God. I mean, if Paul were God-approved, he wouldn't be in prison. God would have saved him. And, and that would have caused the early Christians to maybe doubt this gospel that Paul was proclaiming. And as I read today's section of Colossians, in just a moment, I want you to listen carefully for how Paul addresses that particular concern, how he frames the meaning of his imprisonment. With that, let's read our section for today. Follow along in your own Bible. We're uh, reading Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 24, through chapter 2, verse 5. There, Paul writes, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. 
For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect, or that word can also be mature, in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea, and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. Well, friends, there is so much in this little passage, but there are just a few things that I want to touch on today. Paul wants the Colossian Christians to know that he isn't in prison and suffering because he's foolish or reckless, nor is he in prison because God has abandoned him or is somehow punishing him. Instead, listen again to what Paul says in verse 24. He says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. Paul says two really interesting and interconnected things regarding his imprisonment. First, he says that this suffering is for you, that is for the sake of the Colossian Christians and other Christians. Paul believes his imprisonment is a part of his suffering for the church. And second, he connects his suffering with the sufferings of Christ. What does Paul mean by that? Well, Paul is in prison because he's been proclaiming that Jesus is the messianic king of a new multi-ethnic kingdom. And that got Paul into trouble because in the Roman Empire, only Caesar was king. Only Caesar was Lord and Savior. In fact, those were titles ascribed to Caesar along with Son of God. And the charge against Jesus was that he was claiming to be a king, and that made him a rival to an enemy of Caesar. And so when Paul is imprisoned under the very same accusation, proclaiming Jesus as a rival king, Paul is suffering for the very same reason that Jesus suffered. And because Paul believes that in baptism he has died and has been raised to new life in Christ, Paul directly connects his suffering as a continuation of Christ's work. Far from being a sign that Paul has been abandoned by God, Paul claims that his imprisonment is actually a sign that Paul is following in Jesus' footsteps. His imprisonment validates his spiritual authority. And since he proclaims the gospel and encourages the church, his suffering is for the sake of the Colossians. Hmm. Now, before I address a second important issue in this section of Paul's letter, I want to draw an important distinction between Jesus and Christ. Christ, of course, wasn't Jesus' last name. It's actually a title. It's the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, which means anointed one or chosen one. Jesus was a man who was born and who died. And during his life, Paul says, the fullness of God dwelt within him. That is to say, Jesus was the fullest and clearest visible manifestation of the invisible God. And because Jesus was a man and chose the limits of humanity, he chose to be bound by time and space and gravity and the laws like the rest of us. Christ, on the other hand, according to Paul, existed before creation. In fact, Paul says 
our, and our creedal statements affirm that all things were created through Christ. All things were not created through Jesus. They were created through Christ. And after Jesus died and was raised to new life, he was no longer just a man. He was no longer bound by the limits of time and space and gravity. The one who existed after the resurrection is the pre-existing Christ. So you'll notice that when Paul talks about the post-resurrection presence, he rarely talks about Jesus. He talks about the Christ. And that leads to the second thing that I'd like to highlight in today's reading. Did you catch what Paul said was the mystery, the secret that God revealed through the gospel? <laughs> Listen to it again. Paul writes, and this is the secret. Christ lives in you. Notice Paul doesn't say that the big secret, the big news here is that when you die, you're going to go to heaven, although that's true. The big news, according to Paul, is that Christ lives in you. And again, notice he doesn't say that Jesus lives in you. Christ lives in you. The one through whom all things were made lives in you. And the you in this verse is Plural. Paul is referring to us together as the body of Christ. And the implications of this secret are really quite profound. To understand the fullness of what Paul means, we need to understand it from a Jewish perspective. You see, the presence and the glory of God first dwelled in the temple. It was a sign to the Israelites that God's presence was with them. But then Jesus comes, and as Paul says, the glory of God was pleased to dwell in him. Now God's presence wasn't merely in a temple, it was in a, a person. It was being revealed both to Jews and Gentiles alike. And now, Paul says, something remarkable. Now God's presence, the presence of the Christ, dwells in all believers. The very presence of God lives in us, not in a building, not in a single individual, but in all. What made Jesus so remarkable that the fullness of God dwelled in him is true of us. God dwells in us. Christ dwells in us through the Spirit. We don't need to search for God or reach for God or try somehow to appease God to be with us. God isn't just it's not just us. God lives in us. Think about that. God's presence in you, in me, in us. For Jewish Christians, at the time that Paul was writing, that meant that one of the core callings of a Christian, and certainly of the church as the body of Christ, was to reveal God's glory to the world as Jesus did, most profoundly by the way that we live out the kind of love that we see lived in Jesus. When we live God's love, we reveal God's glory to the world. But believing that Christ dwells in us also assures us that what was true of Jesus will also be true of us. We too will rise to newness of life. We too will share in Christ's glory. What a promise that is to hold on to when life is difficult. What hope it offers in challenging times. No matter what happens in life, we live with the assurance that nothing neither death nor life nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You know, the church has made such a big deal of Jesus being both human and divine, but what we've often failed to do is embrace this great truth is also true for us. We too, by the grace of God, are both human and divine, saint and sinner, bound by time, yet dwelling in eternity. Really, the question we need to ask ourselves, the question we need to wrestle with is, do we believe it? And are we living like it? Well, friends, that's enough for today. Enough to chew on and enough to live out. Be well. I hope to see you soon. God bless you.